Hi everyone, this is Elon Jerno here at the Ayn Rand Institute. I'm here today with Jonathan Honig. Welcome Jonathan. Thank you, great to be with you. And we're here to talk about a book that Jonathan is the editor of and I'm really excited to share it with you. It's called A New Textbook of Americanism, The Politics of Ayn Rand. Congratulations Jonathan. Thank you Elon. I mean it's been a, re a real passion project for me. Couldn't have done it with uh, tremendous help from the Institute support staff and of course its scholars, its donors as well. Um, but this was a piece of Ayn Rand's that I, I first read when I was in college and I, I first discovered it really in the 1990s when I was just getting interested in objectivism. Uh, and you know Rand's writing blew me away then so now to be able to work with the Institute to reintroduce, the, uh, reintroduce her work and bring it out in a new way some what 72 years later uh, from when she first wrote it is really exciting for me and I think for the objectivist movement. Great. Well, I've been reading the book too and I have a chapter in the book and so do some of my colleagues. But what I wanted to start with is just give us an overview of what's in the book. And, and for me, what was so exciting when I first heard about the project is that it contains um, one of Ayn Rand's uh, earliest pieces of nonfiction on politics, and uh, uh, which is very hard to find, but also never before published material from Ayn Rand. So why don't you share us with us what is the book about? Sure. Well, I mean, the, the, the story of textbook of Americanism and a new textbook of Americanism is, is fascinating. Now, Ayn Rand emigrated here in the 1920s, not very familiar with English language. She came here essentially with nothing, worked her way up. Of course, we know her story. It's tr the true American dream. And by the time the 1940s uh, came along, she had already achieved tremendous success as an author uh, and was invited by a group of concerned Hollywood types, actually, if you will. This was the Motion Picture Association for the preservation of American ideals. She saw that the, the collectivist ideas that she essentially escaped Europe because of were encroaching here in America and particularly within the film industry. So she was uh, invited uh, by this group of concerned Hollywood producers to participate in a publication of theirs that was called The Vigil. And this was going to be their editorials about what America is truly about. So Ayn Rand proposed a series called textbook of Americanism. And this was going to be 46 questions uh, written by her for the layman, for everyone, not for philosophical scholars, not for students or, or university professors, but for everyone, basically just laying out the, the essential principles of what is America, what are the, what's America all about? What is this country all about? Now she answered 11 of them and ultimately ended up abandoning the project for fascinating reasons for students of objectivism on Rand about, about why she left, uh, you know, the, the, the group, I think, shortly put, as I understand it, was kind of too milk toast for her. Uh -huh. uh, they, they were not as radical as really she was and, and wanted to be. So she ab abandoned the project and went on, of course, to uh, an, ama even a, uh, an immense corpus. But uh, it's, it's remained. It's always remained until now, Alon. So the, the idea of a new textbook of Americanism is to finish her project uh, it, it, and also include, as you said, her perspective on America that's really never been voiced before. In the 1970s, Ayn Rand participated in what was called workshops on epistemology. These were Q&As in New York City held with her disciples and, and, and colleagues and students of objectivism. And it was really a rare treat. I mean, any of us would you know, jump at the opportunity to basically hang out with Ayn Rand and pepper her with questions for hours. But that's what these people were, these young scholars were able to do. Those sessions were recorded, but never before published. So uh, that, that work's never been seen. Thanks to the Institute, to the archives, and, and Dr. Leonard Peikoff, a lot of that material, specifically on politics, is included in our book for the first time. So you're really getting to read not only vintage Ayn Rand, if you will, her brilliance from the, the 1940s, but also from the 1970s, and more importantly, Elon, how it relates here to America today. Uh, you know, um, the notion of what America is, is up for grabs. I mean, there, everyone is kind of looking around in the political sphere saying, what is this country all about? Rand knew that, she understood it, she understood it back in the 40s, and that's why textbook of Americanism, a new textbook of Americanism, is so relevant today. Yeah, well, thank you for all the work you did to get the book out, and I, I appreciate I've been reading it myself, because there, there are chapters here from other scholars and writers that I, I were new to me, and I've, I've really, be, really been enjoying it. One of the things that struck me is that, so you put it, there's vintage Ayn Rand, and then there's Ayn Rand from the 70s, where she's got really developed views, and she's speaking with scholars. And in between, there's the new material that you've uh, uh, commissioned. But what struck me is that it, the book is incredibly integrated around the theme of Americanism and Ayn Rand's unique conception of that. And it, it, I mean, in the very first question that she answers, what is the basic issue in society today? And this is 1946, uh, um, where the book begins. It is, uh, for her, it's a clash between 
two basic ideologies or uh, worldviews. And it's on the one hand, it's collectivism, which is represented in the Nazis and the co in the communist bloc. And on the other hand, it's individualism, which what she argues is that Americanism is founded on an idea. Mm -hmm. And to me, and I was reading in your introduction, you highlight the ways in which today, everyone talks about Americanism and American exceptionalism, but it's, it's not at all clear that people either mean the same thing or that they understand what it means. And, and what, I, what I took from the book as a whole is Ayn Rand's presenting a really powerful conception, which is it's an idea everyone can come to it's an idea. It's not rooted in your skin color or yes. your way you're born, and it's not a nationalist kind of perspective. It's it's something that everyone everywhere should be able to embrace because it's about the value of the individual and having a society built around that and protecting the individual's freedom. And it's just such a breath of fresh air in today's uh, climate. Yeah, I mean, it's it, you know everyone talks about politics. Political discussion is widespread on the internet. Obviously, it goes on endlessly. Ayn Rand brilliantly, Elon, to your point, she doesn't start with a policy. You know, what do you think of abortion? What do you think of gun rights? She says, no, 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 we want to talk about politics. We have to start all the way at the beginning. Ideas, as you said, and this is part of just the brilliance of Ayn Rand. The brilliance is you couldn't, where do you start? But the brilliance of Ayn Rand, she's able to distill America all the way down and start, as you said, with these basic fundamental questions. What is the basic principle, what is the basic issue in the world today? Individualism and collectivism. That's where she starts her inquiry into what America is all about. From there, she's able to build on what's the right type of government and, well, what about voting and what about these issues and that issues. But as you said, I mean, it's so fundamental to any discussion, any argument on politics. And, you know, to, to borrow a phrase from Rand, you know, it's always go back, goes back to checking one's premises. Mm -hmm. So Rand beautifully starts Textbook of Americanism with that very simple, very poignant uh, uh, question, you know, what is the basic issue in the world today? She believes that it is individualism, as you said, versus collectivism. And what makes America unique? Uh, you know, we, I hope we all love this country. We should all love this country and why we should love this country. Because, you know, Rand doesn't say it's my country right or wrong. You know, she believes you love a country for its ideas. And that's, that's what's so exciting, Alana, about this country is, as you said, I mean, there's a, the section in textbook that I love. I mean, there's, there's so many of them that I love, but you know, one of them, I think it's C. Bradley Thompson who writes about how you, know, you, can, you can move to France, you can live there 20 years, buy the baguettes, do everything, you'll never be French. Same thing even with Canada. Oh, he's just American, he's visiting, he's been here for a while. People move here, they become American. Doesn't matter their skin color, where they're from, because of the ideas. That's huge, I mean, it's almost unpalpable and not replicated still to this day anywhere else in the world. So as you said, I mean, everyone, People think, well, what America is about is, is its Judeo-Christian heritage or that we help each other or that we are a brother's keeper. Uh, I, I shake my head at that. I, don't, I think they're wrong. I believe Ayn Rand would say that they're wrong as well. Uh, and what America's true basis is, is something much more exciting and such more, something much bigger. Uh, you own your own life. You know, we talk about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And these days, it's almost said like, oh, yeah, you know, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, whatever. But... Rand understood what that meant. And uh, that's what makes America so special. And I think the book's so important. And, and to, to your point, um, she felt that this was important enough in the 1940s when her career was fiction writing. I mean, she was really passionate about that. She took time out of that to write a nonfiction presentation of what Americanism is. And at that time, she felt it was important enough. And I think it's still important. And so I, this is why I'm so excited yes. about the book. Yes. It's that this is a really accessible way for people to engage with the issues that are still live today. I mean, it's not as if it's gone away. In fact, it's more intense today. What is Americanism? What is the value of the American system, the original system? And, and obviously, I think we've departed from it. We're not fulfilling the ideal of a society that protects individual rights fully, but we, we're, we're still at a place where people need to understand Americanism, need to understand the ideas of our society. And this is one of the services the book really offers. And I wanted to, to dig in a little on some of the, just to give people a sense of the range of topics sure. that you cover. So sure. you mentioned that she started the series by answering a number of questions that she said. And then there was a number of questions, I think almost 40 questions or something like that, that were left behind that she didn't get to because she, she put the project aside. So why don't you give us a flavor of what some of those questions are? Sure, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, 
the IRN archives houses all this tremendous material. And part of what I discovered when I was starting this project were her handwritten and then typewritten list of questions of this project. She was outlining, as you said, Alon, in the, you know, the 1940s, still as a, as a young woman and, and really at the earlier part of, of her career. So she answered questions like, what is a right? How do we recognize one each other's uh, each other's rights? Can there be a mixed social system? Uh, can a society exist without a moral principle? So she answered some of that. Some of the ones that she didn't answer that we've been able to uh, to answer and bring some light on too is questions like, you know, is voting a substitute for freedom? Uh, can a nation enslave itself voluntarily? How do you recognize a Nazi? Now that's a pretty interesting one. We, we don't have uh, a huge Nazi party alive today. So we've applied that to the alt-right, mm -hmm. which is a very big political force now on, on the scene and has some, some similar elements to, to that element of history. Uh, does a motive change the nature of a dictatorship? Can civil rights exist without property rights? There's a, sections on racism, there's sections on trade, uh, you know, sections on voting and charity. So all these different elements of just what Americanism is, because Alan, is, is your point, I mean, I. I've spoken to uh, you know other intellectuals and other uh, uh, Americans, and their belief, by and large, is that basically, if you can get the votes, that's what it is. Well, we, we voted on it. You know, we well we voted on Obamacare. We voted on tariffs. We voted on anything else. Um, you know, that's an anathema, I believe, and I believe, and Rand would also believe, to what really Americanism is about. This is not a country where everything is up for the for vote. Uh, this, as you said, the unique country where the individual is protected from the government, from others who would, would do him force, uh, in, uh, uh, do fraud upon him. So what makes this country so exciting, so unique, and um, she gets into all of that in the book. So I wanted to pick up on uh, one of the, the essays you mentioned and another one that really I, I read just the other night, the one on voting, uh, the place of voting in a free society by Greg Salmieri, yeah. uh, a friend of ours. Um, and to me, that was really powerful because it raises this issue that uh, many people talk about America as a democracy, and that's not really accurate if you, if you think of it philosophically in the sense of what democracy actually means and what the conception of the American system really was, so the, the individualism of it, which means putting the individual's life beyond the reach not only of, of the king, sort of if you think historically, but also of the mob or, or, or of whoever will round up enough votes to take away your property. So. That's a really powerful essay, and I thought I found it illuminating um, because it explains, I think, well, there is a place for voting in a free society, but it's not the primary feature of a free society. The primary one is a society that protects your individual rights, and it was just such a clarifying yes. way to deal with the issue. Yeah. Um, and then the other one. Uh, I don't oh, can I quickly just say sure. exactly right? Because you know, people w when you ask someone, well, what is America about? What is America? They they might say, I mean. They might say it's about apple pie or kneeling or the Star Spangled Banner or something completely uh, irrelevant. Uh, maybe they'd say the Constitution if they were a little more with it or erudite. But inevitably, Alan, as you said, they would say, where democracy? This country is, everyone gets a vote. This, that's what this country is about. Well, now that's true, but as you said, as Greg kind of very uh, uh, beautifully illuminates, you know, voting is not the essential feature of the American system, despite the fact that we vote. Um, it's that individualism. It's the, the role of government as a protector of each individual. I mean, Socrates, it's, Socrates is the, you know, the classic example of how the mob is able to kill Socrates and by public vote. And that, does, that not only doesn't happen in America, properly understood, that can't happen in America. Uh, and it's part of what Greg touches on, and I think especially now, as you said, is this concept of what this country is all about. Uh, it's, you know, we are not, it's not a country where uh, it's mob rule, where it's up to a public vote. Yeah, for sure, and just for viewers, um, uh, several of the chapters from A New Textbook of Americanism are, uh, we've republished, with your with permission and the permission of the author, we've republished them on our publication, New Ideal, here at the Iron Man Institute. You're welcome to read them. One of them I would highlight is Ankar Gatte's chapter, uh, uh, which addresses sort of the question of what is capitalism, what is a free society, and the, the economic side of the question, which is really powerful, uh, which brings to mind the chapter by Harry Binswanger. Uh, <laughs> and this is a very provocative title, Buy American is Un-American. Yeah. And I think, uh, why don't you, I mean, so your background is in finance and you're kind of in that field. So uh, what I found really powerful about it is and tell me sort of your reaction is that this is exactly contrary to sort of what the president right now is telling people and this whole idea of protecting certain sectors of the economy. 
Um, I, I just I was very pleased that you included that in the book. Oh, I think sure. it really rounds out the picture. Yeah, I mean, um, objectivism is radical. Ayn Rand is radical, and America in its best uh, form is radical. Still, you know, in its best sense is radical. And as you said, Alain, I mean, the, the, the essay by American is un-American, and just all the el elements about economics from Ankar, from Richard Salzman, uh, speak to America as a capitalist country by definition, by conception. Uh, by American is un-American is right up there with immigration mm -hmm. as the type of topic that really angers people, brings out a lot of um, emotion in people. Because as you said, Alain, even you know, as they said, we're not on the left and right dichotomy, but the people who say you love this country would be the first in line to say, well, of course you should buy American. You want to support your fellow Americans. And Harry Binswanger, you know, brilliantly argues about why that type of a nationalist mentality is anathema to what true American principles are. Uh, and I, you know, I use the, uh, use the example in my own life very frequently, you know, whether you buy a Toblerone or a Hershey bar does not, uh, uh, legislate your moral status as an American. You're not a better American because you buy an American Hershey bar. You know, the whole principle of American individualism, it says, you earned it, you spend it. You get what you want. You buy the best damn chocolate bar you want, regardless of where it's from, whether it's made in, in Paris or, or, or down the street. But that notion of individualism, not being beholden to the group, to society, to the nation, that's super radical today. Yeah, I found it, uh, one of the things I enjoyed reading in the book is this idea that you should buy the best product yes. and you should use your best judgment and don't, don't obey these commandments of the people telling you, buy American in the sense that you owe it to some part of the economy, some industry that, y it's just not the right way to think. And part of what I enjoyed about the book is it gives you not only answers to important questions, like what is Americanism, what is a free society, how do you protect it, which Ayn Rand provides sort of the framework uh, for it, which is so powerful. Um, the other authors that contributed to the book fleshed that out in important ways that tied to contemporary issues. A and what struck me is that the, the through line there is a respect for the individual's mind. And that's sort of what is at the core of a free society and the, and the American idea is that you are an individual and that means primarily you are competent and able to think and that's what society should be shaped around. Uh, and it's just such a powerful and important message. In a, uh, yeah, I mean, and of course, the history, a lot of the uh, book has tremendous history in it as well. The history of America, you know, bears that out of when man in this country was left to think uh, for the first time. You had the growth of the consumer class. You had the growth of the wealth for everyone. You know, it was, you know, and, and, and it comes back, uh, you know, of course, to Ayn Rand's understanding of altruism and how, you know, sacrifice, whether it was for the king and I mean, before America, the king owned everything, right? I mean, the king just owned everything, just like in Saudi Arabia now, they have a king. It's pretty, we think of it as pretty backward, but that was the standard for thousands of years up until the point America came along and said, no, 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 it's not the Pope, it's not the king, it's not, you know, the Fuhrer or, or the greater good. You own your life. So powerful, Ron, so uh, revolutionary even now. And But people, I think young people especially now, I mean, I, I'd like to think I grew up with a little bit of that understanding, but it all comes back to education. You know, ironically, with a, with a new textbook, people keep telling to me, well, we need to get some better legislators in there. You know, we just need to get better politicians. The politicians is the last thing. You know, this starts with college kids, people in their 20s and 30s who are just trying to understand their beliefs about politics. It starts with education, and that's what this book is. It's a textbook. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a textbook. This is an easy primer, uh, an educational opportunity for anyone, but certainly young people, just starting to format their ideas about, uh, about America and about politics to understand what it's really about. And uh, before we close, I just want to compliment you, because I think one of the things the book does well for the new material that you kind of helped to shape is it really presents all of these ideas in an accessible way. I mean, this is, it, you, you call it a textbook. Um, it, it is in, a, in the best sense of a, conveying a lot of information in a structured way, but in another sense, it's, it's much more accessible than a textbook. It's really meant for people to dive in and, and sample and, and kind of re-engage with these questions and ideas and become better educated. And I, and I would really second your point about students. I think this is a perfect book for students to read if, they want, if they're at all interested in the debates that are going around about what is America, is, what kind of society should it be. These are uh, really deep questions and I think this book helps to answer those. So, well, thank you, thank you, Lana. I mean, I, it's, the irony is I remember you know, when I was in school, there was, you know, if, if someone wanted a virtue signal that they were interested in ideas, they would buy the Communist Manifesto. Mm -hmm. you know, or I guess today they'd walk around with a book with, um, 
what's his name, knee-high coats or some of these, you know, maybe Cornell West. It's kind of their way of showing that they're, they're interested in ideas. You know, this is a way not just to show that you're interested in real American ideas, but to actually learn about real American ideas. As you said, it's short, it's accessible, it's, it's, it was written for the layman, for everyone, and people will find this is more radical than anything they're learning in class or out of class when it comes to politics in America. Because Ayn Rand, a radical philosopher, the American philosopher. And uh, this book, I hope, speaks to the best of what her ideas are about. So where can people find the book, Jonathan? Thank you. Thank you, Alain. Now, it's available at textbookofamericanism.com. It's available on Audible, Kindle, PDF, all the different formats um, for, for a, a very low price. So textbookofamericanism.com. Great. Well, thanks for being here, Jonathan. My great pleasure. Thank you.